The Bank of England is not moving quite as dramatically as the European counterparts. The UK central bank is keeping its lending rate at a record low of 0.5%, and it's also keeping the size of its bond portfolio steady. So, thus far, no additional spending, but also no cuts to spending. The BOE is trying to keep a steady hand on the UK economy as it continues to show signs of a lukewarm recovery. So, we mentioned the ECB is cutting drastically and the Bank of England is keeping its ship steady, but how do interest rates around the world affect their local economies? We want to ask that question. So we want to show you. On one hand, you have countries such as Australia and Canada. There you can see the UK and officials have held their rates relatively steady near record lows. Their economies are enjoying a slow but steady recovery. But in places like Brazil, it's different. The central bank there is finally taking a breather after a run of rate hikes. Officials had hiked the rate nine straight times before taking a break. Brazil is trying to control rising prices. And in India, it's a different story. Officials there are putting a cap on interest rates. India's central bank has raised its rates three times since September, and it's trying to cool inflation as well as support a struggling rupee currency. Now here's how a quick look on how Wall Street ended the day in reaction to all this news. You can see there the Dow, S&P, and NASDAQ all near or in record territory. So it was a good day overall. The market seemed to like it. But we want to get more analysis on this right now. Jacob Kirkgaard is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics here in Washington, D.C. Uh, good to see you again, and you're going to help us break this down. Sure. Let me first start. A lot of people don't realize um, how powerful the ECB is. But why, in a nutshell, did they cut rates in the historic fashion that they did? Well, I think there's two reasons. One, they wanted to cut rates, but the rates, in this case, the deposit rate, which is the rate that banks get when they deposit money with a central bank, was already at zero. So they, they had to go negative. And the other reason that they wanted to go negative was that they wanted to get a good headline because they're trying to convince Europeans that they have this... Is that a nice way of saying PR? Yeah, basically. Uh, it's good PR for them because they wanted a headline that says we are doing this extraordinary crazy thing of going negative interest rates. So they want Europeans to believe that they will do anything to avoid deflation. Will it work? Because uh, if they do, if people believe that they'll avoid deflation, then they might actually have a better chance of doing so because of a, a virtuous circle. Will it work? I think they, they will succeed. But ultimately, they can't do it alone. They need governments to do reforms and other things as well. So this is just part of the picture. All right. you, and I have had, you and I have had these conversations before. And I have to be honest with you, I, I'm, I'm confused. Because I thought Europe was recovering. I thought Greece was better. I thought France. I, I thought all these places, I know it's not great, but they were all doing better. So for the rest of the world, they look at this and they go, what's going on here? Well, ironically, Europe is doing better. But, and we should remember that low inflation isn't just a problem, quote unquote, in, in Europe. I mean, you know, we have very low levels of inflation here in the United States as well. And, but the problem that Europe has actually has had is that partly because Greece, Italy, Spain, and other countries have been doing better, a lot of money has flown into these uh, uh, economies that has driven up the value of the euro so that the euro exchange rate now is actually arguably too high. For, for Europe, and that has driven down inflation further in Europe. So in some ways, you could say that Europe is sort of a victim of its own recovery, in a way. So we mentioned earlier what other central banks around the world are doing, right? We got Brazil, India, the US, Europe, and so on. Let's just take the US and Europe for, for in this particular instance. The US is considering raising rates at some point in the future, and you have this action by Europe, essentially the opposite. Is this normal? It's quite normal that when you have a global business cycle that the U.S. economy comes out of the cycle or the, the, the recession quicker than Europe, simply because the U.S. economy is more flexible, it adjusts qu more quickly, and that's what we're seeing again here, that the Federal Reserve, which, you know, went for quantitative easing very early on, is now exiting uh, much sooner, whereas the ECB, which really only started getting really serious about expansionary monetary policies, you know, as late as 2010, 2011, two years after the uh, Federal Reserve began its quantitative easing program, is basically sort of behind the curve in a way. But this is, quote unquote, quite normal. Are you ready for my dumb question of the day? Fire. Here it is. 
we're worried about deflation in Europe, right? That's one of the chief concerns. Deflation, essentially, for our audience, is when goods cost less in the future. So if I buy a hamburger today for $1, tomorrow it's 90 cents. Isn't that good for consumers that things cost less in the future? It may explain to us, I know there's a lot of technical terms here, but why is it bad that things cost less in the future? Because I would think as a consumer, I want things to cost less. Yeah. But the, the problem, the, the irony here, the tragedy, if you like, is that it is actually arguably good for you as a single consumer. But it is very bad for the overall economy. Because the reality is that when you individually and everybody else, individual consumers, postpone their purchases because it's going to be cheaper tomorrow, well, then, you know, the shops go bankrupt. Uh, uh, today because they don't have any sales and the economy uh, goes into a funk. And then the other re issue is that when everything costs less, you get less of a paycheck as well. But the debt you have is still the same. So you have a lower wage and a lower income to pay back the same debt, uh, which is, of course, uh, uh, tough not just on you but on the overall economy. So it's, it's really an issue of what is good for the individual versus what is very bad for the economy as a whole. This, this is a fun conversation. Jacob, stay right there, okay? Uh, we're going to have much more with you in just a little bit. But I want to get some other headlines here. U.S. President Barack Obama has warned Russia against further meddling in Ukraine during the G7 summit. He hinted at more sanctions for an economy already struggling to stay afloat. And that could make his upcoming talks with Russian President Putin an unfriendly one. Jack Barton explains. Wrapping up their summit in Brussels, G7 leaders urged Russia to stop the flow of weapons and militants across the Ukrainian border and cooperate with the authorities in Kiev. Given its influence over the militants in Ukraine, Russia continues to have a responsibility to convince them to end their violence, lay down their weapons, and enter into a dialogue with the Ukrainian government. On the other hand, if Russia's provocations continue, uh, it's clear from our discussions here that the G7 nations are ready to impose additional costs on Russia. Additional costs mean sanctions, though leaders disagreed over how tough those sanctions should be, with European leaders worried about risks to their own economies. There was also talk of more political and economic solidarity with Ukraine. Other big issues were covered, including climate change, here, President Obama unveiled a plan to reduce emissions of U.S. power stations by 30 percent. Tensions in the South China Sea were also discussed. In a written statement, leaders also said they opposed any attempt by any nation to pursue territorial or maritime claims in the South China Sea through intimidation. Though the other leaders also reportedly rejected an attempt by Japan to single out China in the communique. On Syria, EU leaders agreed to punish European jihadists engaged in the conflict there. We have agreed to intensify our efforts to address the threat of foreign fighters traveling to and from Syria. The decision follows the recent killing of three people at a Jewish museum in the Belgian capital by a former combatant in that conflict and revelations that more than 30 French fighters have died in Syria. Jack Barton, CCTV, Brussels. France is the next stop for many of the G7 leaders. French President Francois Hollande will host two, mark that, two separate dinners for U.S. President Barack Obama and Russian President Vladimir Putin in Paris. Speaking to reporters, Hollande says the U.S. and its allies need a unified front when pushing for peace between Russia and Ukraine. Obama and Putin have not said that they'll meet in France, but their finance ministers will. Hollande hopes to be the diplomatic bridge between Putin and Ukraine's president-elect. If he's successful, it will be the first time those two have actually met. Now, we're going to have more on this with Jacob Kirkgaard, um, again, senior fellow from the Peterson Institute. This is a strange little dinner they've got set up. So essentially, the stuff that I've been reading, is it's almost like two dinners, but it's actually one dinner where you're going you're gonna to have dinner with this president, and then you're on the other side. Is this not an awkward moment in history for Europe? Well, there's no doubt that this is an awkward moment, but, you know, this is diplomacy. You've got to have people talking together even though they don't want to sit at the same table, right? So what do you do? You have two dinners. Um, well, Francois Hollande be successful in getting all the objectives he wants, which is one, supposedly getting the two sides to actually talk, and then also you have the issue of what's happening in Ukraine as well to be on the table and potentially to have those two leaders meet. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think the reality is that we don't really know what affects and what causes Vladimir Putin to do the, react, do the actions that he has undertaken in the Ukraine. And personally, I'm of the opinion that only credible sanctions will deter him uh, from doing more. Is Francois Hollande going to be the president putting those on the table? I strongly doubt that. This used to be the G8. Now it's the G7. President Putin has said that he doesn't want any part of it. Fine. You don't want me part of the party? I won't come at all. So will there ever be a G8 again, or is that just a war of words and ultimately they'll figure something out? Well, I mean, remember that, that Russia was only invited into the G8, uh, which was the G7 before that, when it was, quote unquote, a real democracy under Boris Yeltsin. So this is kind of back to the future in a way. And, and no, I don't think that Russia will be invited back unless they radically change their policies in the Ukraine. And probably they'll have to leave Crimea, which I don't think they'll ever do. You know, we have you on as a specialist to cover Europe. And so you're looking at this stuff very, very closely in very minute detail. Does Europe care about this relationship with Russia? I mean, obviously, they're tied together economically. But is there going to be a long-term impact in this sort of new, awkward relationship they now have developed? I think Europe cares a lot. I mean, there's energy relations. There's a lot of investments from European firms in Russia. And simply because of the fact that the European economy itself is now at a relatively precarious state, you don't need uh, uh, you know, an economic collapse or meltdown in Russia, because that would hurt, obviously, the European economies. And that's actually why, in my opinion, the Europeans are really so reluctant to do very tough sanctions on Russia. Because in my opinion, the reality is, that if you did that, it would be economically, you know, the Russian economy could very well go into a very serious recession, which would then spill over back onto Europe. There's so much happening in Europe right now. Jacob, thank you for helping us break this down a, a bit. And we're going to, of course, have you back again.